the Western Hemisphere. And when the topic is that broad, a number of things race through the mind of everyone. There are so many topics under that, that general theme and interesting questions of democratization and nation building and regional uh, development and, and uh, uh, our economic interests and certainly our security interests. But uh, whatever may be the collection of thoughts we have, we're very fortunate this evening to be joined by the gentleman who is uh, responsible for United States foreign policy in the hemisphere and for the protection and development of American interests there. Uh, so what we will hear tonight uh, will not only be uh, the definitive view of the highlights of our policy, our approach to the region, but also, um, if I may say, is, is described as a major address in which new ideas about our policies there will be presented. Secretary Noriega has, uh, uh, in his early career, served in several places in the State Department, what was then the Bureau of Inter-American Affairs, uh, the Bureau of Public Affairs, uh, and later uh, uh, was the alternate uh, U.S. representative uh, to the Organization of American States. He then had interesting positions as a, a, a senior advisor to the House's uh, International Relations Committee, and then I think for four years or about, was, uh, had the same kind of position with the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. And uh, he uh, Presently, as you know, being appointed in 2003 uh, to his present position, uh, the position which he held just prior to that was uh, as our permanent representative to the Organization of American States. And as I started to say, he was nominated in the spring of last year to his present position and uh, was confirmed in that position of July, in July of 2003. It's a great honor for us to have a major address presented before this audience. Uh, we appreciate that. And it's my enormous pleasure and privilege to present to you the Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs, Roger Francisco Noriega. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I remember when I was, and I want to thank Frank Bird for that uh, uh, in, uh, very nice uh, introduction. Uh, you didn't have to consult the notes uh, that would, we we have some. We get to write our own bios, so it's a sort of creative writing and <laughs> exercise. Uh, I appreciate that very much, and I appreciate the invitation. I uh, recall being sworn in as permanent representative of the United States to the Organization of American States, and my mother was delighted. She said, "Permanent." So, finally, I had some job security. Uh, and it turned out uh, that it wasn't all that permanent, because a, a year and a half later, the secretary asked me to take on a, a, another assignment. And I was pleased and proud and honored to have the opportunity to take on this new assignment. And, and that's what brings me here. I suppose I'm safe in the assumption that you're here this evening, in part, at least, because you share my view that what happens in the Western Hemisphere is important to you, to our country, and to our economic and political well-being. The, the geography that we share obviously creates the natural economic relations that we have in the Americas. This region represents 800 million market-oriented consumers, $14 trillion in GDP. Three of our top four foreign energy suppliers are in this hemisphere. U.S. exports to Latin America have increased by almost 100% over the past decade, while our exports to the rest of the country have seen gains of less than 50%. Many of these exports going through this port town. Canada and Mexico are our first and second largest trading partners in the world. Our economic relationships in the Western Hemisphere are very significant. And if that were all that we had stake, at stake in the region, it would demand our careful attention. But our political and security interests in the Americas are vital as well. As we fight the global war on terror, it is imperative that we have strong, democratic, 
stable neighbors working with us to secure our borders and to defend our common interests and shared values, both at home and abroad. In short, the stakes are very high for us in the Western Hemisphere. Today, it is in our interest to help the region's elected leaders confront a new challenge that I want to talk to you a little bit about, making democracy work for the general welfare of all of their people. Because unless women and men from all walks of life have a stake in the economic growth in the Latin America and the Caribbean, the gap between rich and poor will widen and genuine prosperity may prove elusive or unsustainable. We have a time-tested solution to this conundrum. Democracy and the rule of law are essential to global development and trade because they empower individuals to share the costs as well as the blessings of prosperity. So that makes the prosperity sustainable over time. As the people of the Americas are free to exercise their essential political freedoms, they naturally will be able to claim their fair share of economic opportunity. In the long run, broad-based economic growth produces greater stability and sustainability. That is our strategy, and that is our challenge today. This evening, I will discuss how far we have come in the Americas in institutionalizing our commitment to democracy and the rule of law. But I will also speak of the unfinished business that we have before us, strengthening our, these, our democratic institutions and, quite simply, governing justly and well. I should note that I received the invitation in September to be with you here today. And when my staff and I considered the invitation, I said that would be a good opportunity to do a little reflection. Not simply reacting to the headline of the day, but reflecting to the challenges that we're, we're confronting. Because I figured, because you are an international city, uh, that you would be looking for a, a more profound appreciation of some of the issues that we're confronting in this part of the world. In the case of the Western Hemisphere, uh, if one were to go simply by the headlines in our daily newspapers, I can under understand how one would come to the impression that things are not going so well, that the region is rife with discontent, and the future of democracy itself is in peril. However, if you step back and look at things from a broader perspective, I would argue that the challenges facing Latin America today are less threats to the idea of democracy than they are growing pains of a region undergoing a quiet, and sometimes not so quiet, revolution of freedom and progress. Indeed, I can remember when I first began my professional career in the 1980s. Scarcely 20 years ago, Latin America was a far different place. Economies and political systems were closed, leading to stagnation and alienation and fueling conditions of armed insurrection. Illegal armies, heavily supplied by the former Soviet Union and Cuba, wreaked havoc. In response, we had military dictatorships fighting an elusive enemy, and in many cases, main, making no distinction between innocent people and combatants. It was an era in which the future of democracy clearly stood in the balance. Today, however, the struggle for democracy that characterized the 1980s has become a mutual effort to deliver the benefits of freedom to every individual in every country, and it is a great tribute to the people of this region to the people of Latin America, the sacrifices that they made to obtain their freedom. The vast majority of Latin Americans and the Caribbean neighbors live today under leaders of their own choosing. The repressive dictatorship of Cuba is the most notab notable and tragic exception. Today, free elections and peaceful transfers of power are the norm. They're how adversaries settle their differences, not on the battlefield, but in a democratic arena of electoral politics. Political progress in the region has gone hand in hand with economic reforms. Although many countries face severe economic challenges today, and poverty is still a very important problem, the old demons are being tamed. Inflation is largely tamed. Countries are increasingly open to foreign trade and investment. They know they have to open up their economies to be competitive and create economic opportunity. Economic setbacks occur, but are no longer lead, leading inevitably to economic crises that affect the whole hemisphere and, as a, fact, as a matter of fact, the world. Indeed, the spread of democratic and economic freedom has opened unprecedented opportunities for millions of people to help lift themselves 
out of misery, poverty. Now, despite all this being said, it must also be recognized that many people in the region are weary of waiting for their lives to get better and for their futures to get brighter. Clearly, there is a lingering dissatisfaction with the quality of democracy and the results that economic reforms have so far delivered. Yet, ironically, I would suggest that such feelings are the measure of how far our hemisphere has really come, politically and ec economically, because the improvements the hemisphere has experienced have created increased expectations for good government and broader responsibility and prosperity. In discussing the progress of democracy in the hemisphere, former president of Bolivia, Jorge Quiroga, an outstanding example, by the way, of a new generation of democratic leaders in the Americas, who also happens to be an avid mountain climber, said that Latin American countries have reached the snow line in their journey up the democratic mountain. They have come far, but there is still clearly hard slogging ahead. And in thinking about that journey forward, we have to begin by recognizing that not all the essential elements for a fully effective democracy are present in all of our countries in the region. Current institutions and values are not always able to keep politicians from misbehaving, to keep the opposition from behaving responsibly, and to keep the frustrations of the vo voters from boiling over. Polls show that Latin Americans, by and large, don't trust their governments and their institutions. In turn, political elites in their region often exhibit a deliberate aloofness from the people they are supposed to represent and to serve. Too often, the activities and concerns of government officials and the majority of the citizens spin in separate orbits. That gulf is often reinforced by illegal, uh, rather legal immunity afforded legislators and the de facto impunity afforded many other government and political actors, just to name one example, one manifestation. The resulting mutual mistrust encourages corruption, which takes the form of outright bribery, sweetheart deals for political cronies, or public benefits reserved for a privileged class. And corruption spreads and continues as long as no one is ever held accountable for their actions. Many formal democratic institutions in Latin America are weak and overly politicized. In some countries, there is not one single body, not a Supreme Court, not an electoral commission, not a regulatory board, which can be relied upon to routinely make impartial, apolitical decisions in accord with the law. Many political parties in the region are not doing their job well. They are often bereft of new ideas, too focused on patronage and too dependent on the very particular skills of one charismatic leader. That spoils mentality is too often reinforced by electoral systems that favor legislative candidacies via party slate, for example, a party list, whereby politicians owe much, too much allegiance to a party structure and not enough to constituents. Poverty and the inequality of income and wealth that characterize much of the region make it difficult for democracy to thrive. Underfunded states lack the resources to apply the rules of the game fairly, even when government officials have the political will to try. Moreover, the global telecommunications revolution has brought home to the masses the huge disparities in lifestyle between rich and poor, causing many to question whether democracy really is working for them and for their children, for their futures, whether their governments are truly representative and effective or even care about their fate. That perception of unfairness is sharpened by some governments' tendency to pay scant attention to minority rights the rights of indigenous people, ethnic minorities, women, children, or disabled persons. On a very basic level, high level of crime in many nations in the hemisphere dampen a voter's enthusiasm for democracy itself. Providing for basic safety of the citizens must be job number one for any government. So if an, if an administration has failed in this essential function, can it ever earn the trust of its citizens? I believe these challenges can be overcome by truly putting in place some missing pieces of the hemisphere's democratic puzzle. When I first read a version of this speech, it was written by one of the more thoughtful people on my staff. 
I said, it's too negative. It reads like a coroner's report. And they're going to say, isn't it his job to do something about these problems? <laughs> so I said, let's go back at it, look at some of the other things I've written and said. Uh, and because we can't sit in my meetings and say, gosh, if we were only in a position to do something about this, because we are, uh, thanks to you and the confidence you put uh, in your government. Taken together, we believe the trust, transparency, effectiveness, inclusiveness, public safety, and political consensus on the need to have decision-making framed by the national welfare, that these things will enable vibrant economies, democracies, to withstand political and economic shock, shocks to the system. They are the essence of governing justly and well. I'll repeat that. Inclusiveness, transparency, trust, effectiveness, and decision-making based on what's important to the nation, not to individual interests. Now, I'm certain that most of us recognize that the democracy in the United States is still being perfected. We sometimes elect corrupt officials. We sometimes re-elect them. We are still trying to find the correct balance between the freedom of the individual and the need to protect society as a whole. We are still debating minority rights issues. The list goes on and on. But our system is increasingly effective at heading off confrontations of letting off steam and a riding out crises from civil war to presidential assassinations to natural disasters to terrorist attacks. Our system is nothing if not resilient. Likewise, I firmly believe that the hemisphere's democracies are growing stronger every day. Indeed, second generation political and institutional reforms are slowly making their way onto the national political agendas of the region. Competitiveness is a key word. If nothing else, national leaders in our hemisphere have to consider how do they make their economies competitive. When they have to reflect on that, when they re realize that they are accountable before voters to deliver results, and when we put it in the context of what are you going to do to make things better for your country and make your country more competitive along with us, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, then you put these leaders on the spot. And when you put it in those terms, it isn't something that the United States is imposing. They're not our values that are, we're imposing. It's not our model that's, that we're imposing. But what we're saying is work together with us. We know what works. We proposed in a summit uh, in Monterey in January an agenda. A lot of people said, including good friends of ours in the region. You don't want the president to show up in January. There's going to be a drubbing about the failure of the Washington consensus. They're going to tell you that the model has failed. The poverty is worse than ever. They're going to say that we need to change the way we finance our economies, that we have to be more dependent on economic assistance from the United States. And we said, no, we're not, we're not going to go that way. We're not going to fight that battle. We're going to move on to the next front. And we're going to talk about how do you deepen these reforms. You've made, we, we, we go into some of these regions and uh, countries and we assess the macroeconomic picture. And so I went down to Mexico in 1996 and they said, well, great news, the Mexico has bounced back from the macro from the crisis, the peso crisis of 1994-95. The macroeconomic picture is great. Problem is, and I brought this up to my friends there in Mexico City, the poor have less of a share of the economy than they had 20 years ago. So the problem about judging from the macroeconomic indicators is that none of us live in the macroeconomy. We all live in the microeconomy. And so then, rather than talk about the failures of uh, of macroeconomic reform to produce real results, we have to look at why we failed. That we have to play, as they do down the street here, the little game, play the little game. Microeconomic reforms, opening up economy. So we said, we're going to go to Monterey with an agenda that talks about property rights, about shortening the time it 
takes to start a business in the Americas. It takes 100 days to start a business in Brazil, on average. In Canada, it takes two. In the United States, it takes three. And the, my Brazilian friends, in reality, 100 days is an average. The fact is, no one starts a business. Some lucky guy started a business 20 years ago, and he's bringing the average to 100, 100 days. If you can't start a business, you can't get credit. So we talk about starting a business and property rights so you, people can get access to credit. So the private sector has an opportunity uh, to start to generate jobs because we know that big, that we know that small business in the United States and in the rest of the world creates 60, 70, 80 percent of the new jobs. So if we're going to start, jumpstart this economy, you have to start with the basics, that playing the little game, the microeconomic reforms, the second generation reforms, uh, education, making your educational systems accountable. So we showed up with this list, and some of my Latin American friends still said, well, what are you guys going to bring? I said, we brought the list. <laughs> because these things worked for us. It wasn't so long ago that Robert Kennedy was wandering through Appalachia. We have problems. You can find places that look like Appalachia on our border with Mexico. We're bringing this equation to bear, the microeconomic reforms, microenterprise, helping individuals defend their own interests. We're bringing those things to bear on poverty, and it's producing real results in the United States. It's worked here. That model works here, and I would stack it up against any other model in the world. And so what's the beautiful thing is that we came out of that summit in January with all of the countries agreeing to that list of economic reforms. We, we went, instead of saying, we're going to fall back and defend and say, no, we, we need to, we, what we need to do is give you more money, we said, no, what you need to do is govern better, govern more effectively, govern, govern well. Why? One simple uh, a number tells a, a long, uh, quite a story. Investment in the region, about $250 billion. Income generated by trade in Latin America and the Caribbean, another $250 billion. Remittances sent home by the United States, uh, by workers here in the United States, sent back home, about another $30 billion. $530 billion of income going into these economies. Governments that can't make $530 billion work can't ask us to heap more loans on poor people because these governments can't adopt the right reforms and govern justly and govern effectively. They, another half a billion dollars of economic assistance, half a million dollars or half a billion dollars of economic assistance from the United States is not going to make a difference if you, these economies are not retooled. So it comes down to competitiveness. That's the economic model. And I want to talk a little bit briefly about the, poli the political part, part of this equation, because that goes hand in hand. Because you have to have democracy and the rule of law to run a modern economy. You're not going to attract invest investment if, a, if a, uh, a foreign investor can't repatriate their capital or get a contract enforced in courts. So you have to have the democracy and the rule of law going hand in hand. So if a, if a newly elected president in Latin America would have come to me and say, how do you build a better democracy? Because I've actually had, and I feel very proud about this, I've had a couple of presidents of Latin American countries, important presidents, important countries, say to me, I want my country to be like this one. Now, does that mean they want to get rid of their pyramids and, and, and expunge their culture and their history? Absolutely not. These, these particular presidents in particular wouldn't say that. But they want to be able to make a phone call. Uh, they want to be able to, where the phones work. They want kids to have access to clean water. Basic things. They want to have the trash picked up without paying a 40% premium to some crony. And that's what they want. So if someone were to come to me and say, how do you make our system a little better? I would say, I, would, I have some specific examples and ideas. You have to reach out to your opposition and your civil society and your minority groups. Dialogue builds trust. And the trust is the key element of encouraging real political participation and keeping the political pot from boiling over. It channels people who have grievances. It channels those grievances and gets them resolved or 
in one way or another through dialogue. You have to publicize your successes. We had a president of Bolivia, Gonzalo Sanchez de Lozada. I'm sure many of you have heard of him. He lost, he, he resigned from power under pressure uh, six months ago in September. He was a terrific leader. He had all of the macroeconomic equation down. The problem is he didn't tell anybody about the successes of his program. In Bolivia, you would think, because the president was taken down by mobs in the streets, that the country would have been victimized by a macroeconomic failure. Life expectancy up 10 or 12 years. Infant mortality down significantly. Literacy up by 10 or 15 percent in the last 20 years. Uh, Bolivia has come a significant way out of poverty because of these macroeconomic policies. So it wouldn't, you wouldn't want to say make a U-turn. The problem is that President Sanchez de Lozada didn't stop to tell anybody what they had achieved and where he was headed. And so this pot boiled over. So publicize your successes. Lord knows everybody's going to know about your failures. Citizens need to know when the government is being effective. They want to know what, they want to be part of decisions. They want to know where you're headed. They want to know when schools are inaugura inaugurated or when inoculation programs are undertaken. They want to know what you're doing with your natural gas uh, uh, resources. In Bolivia, they, people were, felt, uh, were fed a bill of goods by the opposition, who aren't democratic in particular, who said that if we sell gas to uh, the outside world, that we're, going, that we're not going to have enough gas to cook our food. Bolivia is sitting on one of the, maybe the second largest deposits of natural gas in the hemisphere. And, and people and politicians and demagogues are out telling them that they're not going to have enough gas to cook their food. So you have to publicize your successes. Tell people where you're going. You have to learn to work with and cultivate responsible media. They're out there. You can't publicize your successes or counter your critics without them. You have to visit, vigorously prosecute corruption, zero tolerance. Peruvian novelist and one-time presidential hopeful Mario Vargas Llosa, I'm sure you've heard of him, has observed that cynicism is one of Latin America's most prominent cultural traits because most citizens consider politics to be the art of theft. The cycle of cynicism will be broken when the facts on the ground are changed. No sooner, no later. You have to institutionalize transparency in government. Sunlight and fresh air are natural disinfectants. Consider using electric, electronic procurement for government contracts, sponsoring freedom of information legislation, and establishing an ombudsman offered a, uh, office to monitor allegations of corruption. These are things that are being done, practical things that are being done by governments in our region. You can look at the national budget of Nicaragua on their website. And you can see where all the money's coming in and all the money that's going out. Deliver accountability of elected officials to their constituents. Politicians are more likely to behave responsibly if they can easily be held accountable by voters from a defined district or are subject to judicial sanctions. Empower local government. People do interact with local politicians. Granting municipal governments real responsibility and revenue can tamp down corruption and give people a greater sense of direct participation in a political system. Build an impartial, professional, and apolitical judiciary and a professional police force to go along with it. Nothing mocks democracy more than a creaky, corrupt judicial system. Some countries in the region have enjoyed great success in judicial reform by, for example, streamlining civil, civil code procedures, introducing computerized case tracking systems, staggering the appointment of Supreme Court justices, and naming judicial councils that oversee the hiring of officials, firing and disciplining them as well. Extend economic opportunity to people from all walks of life. It's, it's impossible to wipe out co uh, poverty and inequality overnight. But the path to prosperity is built upon affording individuals the opportunity to pull their own weight and to create personal wealth, become stakeholders, contributing to the greater good. 
focusing on areas of reducing red tape in business registration, broadening access to bank credit. You go to Latin America and many countries, particularly in Central America, as I'm sure many of you have traveled there, you can find the bank. The only thing that's missing around this bank is a moat. It's the high gates, perfectly groomed, beautiful. The only thing they're missing is the moat. <laughs> Drive up windows? Who would have thought of that? You don't even have to get out of your car and maybe you get some credit and actually buy a car. Broadening access to credit then, banking the unbanked, as we say, is important. Harnessing remittances for productive purposes and providing wider access to education and property titling. These are important aspects to jump-starting economic opportunity. Work with your partners in the world. We have provided democracy building assistance in the hemisphere ranging from legal code reform and judicial training to anti-corruption projects and conflict resolution. President Bush has put a premium on good governance and social investment, which he recognizes as critical to the future of the Americas. And that's why he announced the Millennium Challenge Account Initiative, which has now become law. It's been funded about $850 million. If fully funded by Congress, the MCA will increase our core development assistance by 50%, resulting in a $5 billion annual increase over current levels by fiscal year 2006 and beyond. Those monies will be directed to those countries that govern justly and honestly, that uphold the rule of law, that fight corruption, that invest in their people, basic services, education, and health, and promote economic freedom. Corruption is the one thing, President Bush says, that is not negotiable. If you're a corrupt government, you have no business receiving this additional assistance. Unlike traditional assistance programs, the Millennium Challenge account will provide an incentive for countries to invest in their people so that they have the resources and opportunities, such as, as I said, education, adequate health care, nutrition, and equality before the law to improve their own lives and to contribute to the greater good. Very interesting email I received from the Nicaraguan ambassador several days ago. He, all he did was he said, look, this is how we're using MCA back at home. He attached three separate articles from the newspapers from various days and weeks in Nicaragua. One says, President Bolaños, Enrique Bolaños, President Bolaños says if we don't pass judicial reform, we may not be eligible for MCA assistance. Another one, if we don't professionalize uh, the civil service, we may not be eligible for MCA assistance. A third article says, gosh, it has Andrew Natsios, the head of AID, saying, gosh, it would be a, a terrible, terrible shame if Nicaragua were left out because it failed to combat corruption, prosecute corrupt officials. So he's using this offer of assistance the way you should as a lever on the rest of the political system in his country. And he's delivering real results. He's essentially the poster child. He says, I'm the 75-year-old poster child. I don't know how many of you have met him or, or heard of him or, or read a little bit about him, but here's a man, 75 years old, who, is, who has a plan on where his country will be 25 years from now. The rest of the politicians in the country of Nicaragua are fighting about whether they'd be better off in the 40s or the 80s, <laughs> under Samosa or under the Sandinistas. This 75-year-old man wants to know where are we going to be in the year 2020. It's remarkable, remarkable. And he is precisely the sort of leader we want to reward. Before I conclude this evening and take some of your questions, I wanted to touch on an issue that has been in the headlines and will likely return. Uh, it is clear that in looking over the democratic experience in Latin America over the past 25 years, simply put, elections alone do not make a strong democracy. Certainly, broad-based, fair, transparent, and constitutionally guided elections are essential in conferring a democratic mantle upon an elected leader. But democratic elections do not bestow a divine right to govern, which is why we have a separation of powers. 
checks and balances, impeachment clauses, revocatory referenda, to rein in those who might abuse power. A genuinely democratic leader is expected to govern within a democratic framework that upholds the rule of law, guarantees basic freedoms, protects minority rights, ensures the integrity of democratic institutions, and perhaps above all, puts the nation's interests above personal or political fortunes. Sometimes elected presidents forget those simple rules. Former President Fujimori of Peru comes to mind, as does former President Jean Bertrand Aristide of Haiti. I would argue that Mr. Aristide, through his own actions, squandered his democratic mandate as an elected president over the course of the past eight years by corrupting and undermining the fundamental institutions of his own government. He systematically violated each of these precepts of good governments that I outlined earlier, alienated sectors of civil society, and undermined his moral authority by abusing the rights of others. In a final act, he chose to resign, avoiding a bloodbath and giving Haitians an opportunity to build a better future. Today, Haiti is slowly putting itself back together. We, we together with our international community are working to reinforce the new government's legitimacy and increasing its effectiveness. Day by day, things are improving. The creation of a stable democracy in Haiti, unfortunately, is a long-term proposition. But I dare say the timeline for the rest of the countries in the hemisphere is much shorter. And hopefully our leaders in the region are listening. Toward the end of their professional lives, historians Will and Ariel Durant penned the short book entitled The Lessons of History which attempted to distill the essence from their 11 volume, The Story of Civilization, which I have to admit I did not read. The Durants observed that, quote, if we were to judge forms of government from their prevalence and duration in history, we should have to give the palm to monarchy. Democracies, by contrast, have been hectic interludes. But the pair goes on to conclude that democracy has done, quote, more good than any other form of government, and to suggest that democracy will be real and justified if we understand that though men cannot be equal, their access to education and opportunity can be made more nearly equal. Democracies can only fully succeed if all citizens believe that they have been granted the right and opportunity to succeed as individuals, not granted, that's a mistake, that they have the right. Any leader in democracy who ignores that imperative, who doesn't apply the law, doesn't broaden, broaden educational opportunity and reward individual economic enterprise, may indeed learn the hard way that democracy can be nothing more than a hectic interlude. Thank you very much, and I'll take any questions. <laughs> The question is, what will a uh, post-Castro uh, future look like? Better. Um, <laughs> we are planning for that opportunity. Uh, this president has formed a commission for assistance to a free Cuba, chaired by Secretary Powell, coordinated by me. It has brought, uh, for the last several months, the President announced it in October. We owe him a report on May 1st. We will meet that deadline. Um, that will identify how we hasten the democratic change uh, and how we will respond agilely and decisively to ensure that the political and economic reforms in Cuba are broad enough and deep enough that people have genuine opportunity, genuine freedom. What I w really wake up uh, tossing and turning about, I should say, is the prospect that after Castro, we don't move quickly enough and, and to extend economic opportunity and create economic freedom for people so that they may look back at Castro and say, gosh, those were the days. That's the good old days. That would be a disaster for the Cuban people, for us. Uh, and so this plan will lay out how we work with the, our neighbors in the hemisphere and the rest of the world to bring about that change, how we'll be guided by principles, and how, above all, 
we, we respect what the Cuban people want. They have to have a role in making these decisions. So this plan, it's an extensive plan, uh, uh, and, uh, but it, it is not a blueprint. It's how we set up ourselves to respond to the opportunity. So Cuba was a successful country in 58. Uh, Castro talks about the achievements of the revolution. All he managed to do was teach people to read and then take away their books. Uh, we have to be able to do a little better than that. Uh, Cuba in 1958 was ahead of most of the countries in Latin America, had a lower infant mortality rate than Spain. And rest of the Western Hemisphere has zipped out and come up even with Cuba on most economic indicators, but they've managed to keep more or less their political freedom in this, pro in this, in this, in this time frame. So we have to uh, uh, listen to the people and give them economic and political opportunity, uh, 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 do what we can to ensure that you don't have vestiges of the regime holding on striking accommodations with uh, others in the international community to try to get, keep, try to continue this kind of crony arrangement. Uh, but uh, so we're looking for genuine democracy. I think the essence of the question is, would you comment upon the uh, possibility that some Mexican leaders view massive immigration as a means of recovering territories which they feel they've lost? Mm -hmm. More or less. Uh, <clears throat> Well, uh, we certainly uh, believe that our borders with Mexico are fixed and they have to be secured. Uh, and, but it is an extraordinarily difficult task when uh, you have the economic disparity that exists. Uh, I should say at the outset, in the interest of full disclosure, I'm Mexican-American. Uh, and I don't want to be party to giving any part of the United States to Mexico. Um, and uh, that we also have to enforce our immigration laws. It's very difficult to do, again, because of economic disparity. So one of the things we've emphasized in our relationship with Mexico is making their economy more competitive. They can do some things to, to keep up and to generate more economic growth. The fact of the matter is they're not doing that. The reality of it is that the opportunities presented by the election of President Fox have not produced the profound results uh, that we expected and that we hoped for to really open that economy up. Uh, so they're less competitive now vis-a-vis -vis China, for example, than they, might have, than they were five years ago. They haven't taken full advantage of the opportunities presented by NAFTA, for example, to create jobs there. Uh, they, as a matter of fact, they've lost jobs in the maquila industry along the border. They've lost uh, about a quarter of a million of the 1.5 million jobs that were up there on the border. Those people are unemployed because they can't compete with the wages that are being paid in China. Uh, and the problem is these people are not in Zacatecas and Guerrero and Chiapas. They're on the border. <laughs> so we have to Toral our border, we have to do a, a good job enforcing it and ensuring that immigration is safe, legal, orderly, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, regularized. So the president has an initiative uh, to make it possible for people who want to come here and work to register if they can be matched with a willing employer. And that willing employer has to establish that he or she has offered that job to a U.S. citizen before they can employ somebody from outside the country. So the first thing to do in the interest of national security, really, is to find out who's here. I mean, this is maybe five, eight million undocumented persons in the United States. Uh, and uh, I think that these people also are building our economy. They're here because employers want to pay them a wage. Uh, if we get it if we get it to where it's regularized and it's brought in under the law, then they have to pay them a fair wage, at least, and then maybe that job is a little more attractive to, to a U.S. citizen. And then these people eventually, we would expect, would go home as their economy recovers. Uh, but um, so I, I'm not 
we're not prepared for to accept a reconquista by the, the word, reconquista. right, right, exactly. Uh, they do say that. They say you took half our country and the best half. They say the biggest half. They say. I haven't had ask. I haven't had very many of them ask me for the territory back. I'm afraid they they know what answer they would get from me. Two questions: If you accept the premise that there was something wrong with our elections in Florida, and and if you're upset about placing leaders in Liberia, uh, is there a basis for cynicism? On, uh, yeah. Does that breed cynicism in yes, America? Indeed. Well, it's interesting. Two interesting questions. Um, uh, I was at the inaugural inauguration of Vicente Fox in January. I think it was might have been on the sixth or the first. I can't sixth uh, in Mexico, and I was at a dinner with a lot of Latin American leaders, and uh, we at that point, uh, this was January sixth. We had we didn't have a new president elected yet. Uh, this was in two thousand one, uh, because it was tied up, and um, in the process that we're all familiar with. And I was expecting a little bit of snickering. And so I sort of sheepishly alluded to the case, and they said, ah, oh, come on. If this were Latin America, the military would have stepped in and settled this a long time ago. And w would that have been better? Uh, and they said, what you have, and this is really rings, it was very made a big impression to me, uh, a Peruvian leader who was running for president at the time, or she eventually ran for president. Unfortunately, she didn't win. But uh, she said, uh, you have strong institutions. And those institutions are strong because more or less people have confidence in them. Uh, I mean, I remember having this debate over the line item veto for 25 years. Uh, and then the Supreme Court, we finally passed it. Everybody's delighted. Then the Supreme Court struck it down, and everybody said, oh, I guess that discussion's <laughs> over because it's unconstitutional. Uh, and we trusted the institution, and, 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 we, and we, so I think that Latin Americans appreciate the strength of our institutions, uh, 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 and, and so you don't really get that much cynicism from that experience. On the other issue of Iraq, for example, you hear some strange things. A lot of countries uh, disagreed with that policy, but I, I should note that about 11 or 12 countries in the hemisphere joined the coalition of the willing. About four uh, or five put troops on the ground in, in, um, in Iraq. They're, they have troops there now, the Dominican Republic, Honduras, El Salvador, Nicaragua, um, I, th I hope I didn't, and Honduras. Salvadorans just lost a soldier. He was buried uh, on Saturday. Uh, so they, and I, we had others, uh, Paraguayans, little country. And the president, I was in the Oval Office with President Duarte Frutos when he told President Bush, we have to do what we can to help. You folks are sharing, carrying most of the load, but we have to do what we can because you're fighting this evil of terrorism. And quite frankly, I would say that the idealism that I hear more about fighting terrorism and confronting these threats is just as impressive as the cynicism. But you do hear, do hear some cynicism. We had some Caribbean leader say, I'd hate to have, think that the United States can choose who our prime minister is after we toppled Saddam Hussein. And I thought, well, OK. After you violate 17, after this little Caribbean country violates 17 UN Security Re Council resolutions, develops weapons of mass and destruction, and uses them on their own people, uh, invades other countries and attempts an assassination of a former U.S. president, maybe we will get a little irritable about this Caribbean country. But until then, it's sort of implausible and almost cynical for them to suggest that we have any interest in toppling every government that, that comes along. Uh, so I, I think it's been, it's a mixed bag. The question is, what are your criteria for giving aid? And I, if I understood correctly, you were asking, did uh, President Aristide meet those criteria? Would you give some example of how you measure the In criteria? terms of aid? Well, we, we stopped giving aid to the government of Haiti because it was disappearing. 
Uh, and so uh, about five years ago, we stopped giving aid to the government of Haiti because it was being stolen by the, by the government. And we started delivering assistance through non-governmental organizations. Um, we uh, uh, the uh, President Aristide, uh, uh, because of uh, some elections in the year 2000 that, we, that many international observers believe were stolen, uh, the international financial institutions stopped providing lending uh, to the government because they didn't have a, a, parliament, or, uh, a parliament that was considered legitimate by the international community. So they lost that aid too. Uh, the, um, but by and large, we uh, don't have a litmus test for countries that receive economic assistance. Uh, this Millennium Challenge account will have, a, it, there are literally like 20 indicators that uh, uh, economic freedom index, and, and you can look for it on the internet, Millennium Challenge account, you'll find the formula. And literally countries are, are have to, they're uh, measured uh, on, on a scale of whether they qualify for this Millennium Challenge account. But by and large, for most of our economic assistance, we don't have, uh, uh, we don't make judgments about whether a country is uh, democratic or not when we provide them assistance of a humanitarian nature, for example. Most of our assistance to Haiti was for a, a, a people suffering from HIV AIDS and, and, and uh, who needed food. And We've been feeding a million people a year, in, a million people a day in Haiti for 40 years. And, uh, and then we continued that. Uh, but they, what, but don't, I mean, I, what I tell people about Haiti is don't lose hope because the Haitian people are very creative and, and talented people. When they come here, they do great. They do wonderfully, uh, incidentally. So I, several years ago, I said, look, this is what we're going to do on my watch at the OAS, when I'm the ambassador of the OAS. We're in high priority on promoting democracy in Haiti respecting human rights in Haiti and averting humanitarian disaster. And everybody would say, I say, well, that's pretty simple and obvious. I said, well, then why haven't we done it for 70 years in Haiti if it's so obvious? Uh, they need a break. And they, I think they'll do well if we are rigorous about our own principles and, and, and uh, uh, limiting corruption, giving people the right to make their own decisions for themselves. Uh, and we don't have a client in Haiti. For the last 10 years, we had a client. His name was Aristide. For the, for, from 94 to 2000, uh, he could do no wrong because we put him back in power. And so all of his human rights abuses and his corruption, we couldn't say he's corrupt because we put him, we had a helicopter and landed him on the National Palace lawn. We put him back in power. So, so for the years of the previous administration, they couldn't admit that they had done anything wrong. Uh, by putting him back in power. Now we can tell the truth. We don't have a client. And when this new government, this interim government that's in power now, says, well, we're, we're going to let these guerrillas, uh, criminal gangs, we're going to fold them into the army. I, I told our ambassador, go tell them, then do it with your own money. Because we're out. We're out of here. You're on your own. What are the chances of civil war in Venezuela? They're too great. They're greater than they should be uh, because of a policy of polarization that's being pursued by President Chavez, uh, of demonizing his enemies, of undermining all of the institutions of the government, uh, of uh, uh, using um, military force against peaceful demonstrators. Uh, response, essentially governing quite irresponsibly, in my view. Uh, so there is a petition process uh, under Constitution that he helped write. They can recall the president if uh, a certain number of citizens sign a petition. And there's that process is un being considered right now. Three point, according to the Organization of American States Observers, 3.4 million Venezuelans signed a petition to recall him. 
according to public opinion polls, about 65% of the people in Venezuela would vote to recall him if given the opportunity. I think President Chavez is determined uh, by hook or by crook to avoid extending that right to vote to the people in Venezuela. Uh, and so it's very troubling. We're, work we're supporting the multilateral efforts uh, led by the OAS and the Carter Center. Uh, to uh, help the democratic opposition organize itself, um, to support the work and observe the work of the Con National Electoral Council. Uh, and we hope that uh, they will make uh, sound decisions in the next two weeks, really is the crunch time, uh, on uh, this petition process. They, they basically, the National Electoral Council threw out a million signatures uh, saying that, well, the problem with the signature form is that the person monitoring the booth filled out the name and signature, and all the person, all the voter did was sign. So all those are out, uh, throwing them out automatically. The problem was that no one ever told people that you couldn't do that, and even the Chavistas who were recalling people did the same thing. So, but the so Consejo. Uh, threw out all those signatures on a three to two vote. And uh, so now they have to have a, now they're working out a process where a million citizens can show up at a vote, at, at booths, 2,700 booths around the country and say, yep, I really signed. So it's a snipe hunt, <laughs> essentially, uh, for those of you who are familiar with snipe hunts. Uh, and Venezuelan people are working hard to assert their rights. I should say that the dilemma of Chavez, the conundrum of Chavez, and the, 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 it was created by political parties that forgot what, that what they were about was representing people's interests. They became corrupt. Uh, and their only role was tossing power back and forth to one another in a very narrow band of, of elites. So Chavez came in, he led a coup attempt, he failed. They put him in jail and he ran for president and now he's the president. But the, the, peep, the corruption, the, uh, the, these political elites essentially created Chavez. And now they're having to deal with him. Uh, but we hope it can be done peacefully. It's a very, very frightening prospect. I apologize for speaking so long. I give a long-winded well, we, answer. Well, we thank you very, thank you much. very much.